Hello, my second grade friends. We are back with the tale of Despero. Um, so where we left off, Despero was in the dungeon. Um, he was saying words like once upon a time, and he was saying the name of Princess P. And then he heard this great booming voice from the darkness, and he fainted. So that's where we left off. And today we're going to be reading chapters 15 through 21. So we're going to stop right before chapter 22. And um, there's not going to be a lesson with today's reading. Um, I thought it would be important to share um, the importance of just reading for fun and reading to listen to a really good story and getting all comfy and cozy and just diving into the story um, for fun, for entertainment. Um so go ahead and grab your favorite snack, grab a blankie, grab your favorite stuffy, and get comfortable because we're going to be reading a lot of chapters today. And um, we're also going to be uh, introduced to a lot of new characters. So now what's really cool about this book is that there's actually four little books inside this one big book. So all of what we read so far about Despero and his life and growing up and him being sent to the dungeon and him meeting the princess and all that good stuff, um, that's all the first book. So we're going to end the first book today and start the second book where we'll meet a bunch of different new characters and have a different setting and different events, um, but it's still the Tale of Despero book. I know it's kind of confusing, but it's basically like they divided the book up to four sections, and we just are going to um, finish up the first section and move on to the second section of the book. Okay? Awesome. <clears throat> Chapter 15, Light. When Despero awoke, he was cupped in the large calloused hand of a human, and he was staring into the fire of one match and beyond that match, there was a large, dark eye looking directly at him. A mouse with red thread, boomed the voice. Oh, yes, Gregory knows the way of mice and rats. Gregory knows, and Gregory has his own thread, marking him. See, mouse? And the match was held to a candle, and the candle sputtered to life, and Despero saw that there was a rope tied around the man's ankle. Here's the difference between us. Gregory's rope saves him and your thread will be the death of you. The man blew the candle out, and the darkness descended, and the man's hand closed more tightly around Despero, and Despero felt his heart start up a crazy rhythm of fear. Who are you? he whispered. The answer to that question, Mouse, is Gregory. You are talking to Gregory the Jailer, who has been buried here, keeping watch over this dungeon for decades, for centuries, for eons for eternities you are talking to gregory the jailer who in the richest of ironies is nothing but a prisoner here himself oh said despero um may i get down gregory the mouse wants to know if gregory the jailer will let him go listen to gregory mouse you do not want to be let go here in this dungeon you are in the treacherous dark heart of the world and if Gregory was to release you, the twistings and the turnings and the dead ends and the false doorways of this place would swallow you for all eternity. Only Gregory and the rats can find their way through this maze. The rats, because they know the way it mirrors their own dark hearts. And Gregory, because the rope is forever tied to his ankle to guide him back to the beginning. Gregory would let you go, but you would only beg him to take you up again. The rats are coming for you, you see. They are? Listen, said Gregory. You can hear their tails dragging through the muck and filth. You can hear them filing their nails and their teeth. They are coming for you. They are coming to take you apart piece by piece. Despero listened, and he was quite certain that he heard the nails and the teeth of the rats, the sound of sharp things becoming sharper still. They will strip you... Well, they will strip all the fur from your flesh and all the flesh from your bones. When they are done with you, there will be nothing except red thread. Red thread and bones. Gregory has seen it many times, the tragic end of a mouse. But I need to live, said Despero. I can't die. <laughs> you can't die? <laughs> That's lovely. He says he can't die. Gregory closed his hand more tightly around Despero. And why would that be, mouse? Why is it that you cannot die? 
because I'm in love. I love somebody. It's my duty to serve her. Love, said Gregory. Love. <laughs> Hark you. I will show you the twisted results of love. Another match was struck and the candle was lit again. And Gregory held it so its flame illuminated a massive, towering, teetering pile of spoons and kettles and soup bowls. Look on that, mouse, said Gregory. That is a monument to the foolishness of love. Uh, what is it? asked Despero. He stared at the great tower that reached up, up, up into the blackness. What it looks like. Spoons, bowls, kettles, all of them gathered here as hard evidence to the pain of loving a living thing. The king loved the queen, and then the queen died. This monstrosity, this junk heap is the result of love. I don't understand, said Despero. And you will not understand until you lose what you love. But enough about love, said Gregory. He blew out the candle. We will talk instead about your life and how Gregory will save it, if you so desire. Why would you save me? Despero asked. Have you saved any of the other mice? Never, said Gregory. Not one. Why would you save me, then? Because you, Mouse, can tell Gregory a story. Stories are light. Light is precious in a world so dark. Begin at the beginning. Tell Gregory a story. Make some light. And because Despero wanted very much to live, he said, Once upon a time. Yes, said Gregory happily. He raised his hand higher and then higher still until Despero's whiskers brushed against the leathery, time-worn ear. Go on, Mouse, said Gregory. Tell Gregory a story. And it was in this way that Despero began the became the only mouse sent to the dungeon whom the rats did not reduce to a pile of bones and a piece of red thread. It was in that way that Despero was saved. Reader, if you don't mind, this is where we will leave our small mouse for now, in the dark of the dungeon, in the hand of an old jailer, telling a story to save himself. It's time for us to turn our attention elsewhere. It's time for us, reader, to speak of rats, and one rat in particular. This is the end of the first book. <clears throat> book the second, Chiroscuro. <clears throat> Chapter 16, Blinded by the Light. As our story continues, reader, we must go backward in time to the birth of a rat, a rat named Chiroscuro, and called Roscuro. A rat born into the filth and the darkness of the dungeon several years before the mouse Despero was born upstairs in the light. Reader, do you know the definition of the word chiroscuro? If you look in your dictionary, you will find that it means the arrangement of light and dark, darkness and light together. Rats do not care for light. Roscuro's parents were having a bit of fun when they named their son. Rats have a sense of humor. Rats, in fact, think that life is very funny. And they are right, reader, they are right. In the case of Chiroscuro, however, the joke had a hint of prophecy to it. For it happened that when Roscuro was a very young rat, he came upon a great length of rope on the dungeon floor. Ah, what do we have here, said Roscuro. Being a rat, he immediately began to nibble at the rope. Stop that, boomed a voice and a great hand came out of the darkness and picked the rat up by its tail and held him suspended upside down. Were you nibbling on Gregory's rope, rat? Who wants to know, said Roscoe, for even upside down he was still a rat. You smart-alecky rat, you smart-alecky rat, nib-nib nibbling on Gregory's rope. Gregory will teach you to mess with his rope. And keeping Roscoe upside down, Gregory lit a match with the nail of his thumb and held the brilliant flame right in Roscoe's face. Ah, said Roscoe. He pulled his head back away from the light, but alas, he did not close his eyes, and the flame exploded around him and danced inside him. Has no one told you the rules, said Gregory. What rules? Gregory's rope is off limits. So... Apologize for chewing on Gregory's rope. I will not, said Roscoe. Apologize. No. Filthy rat, 
said Gregory. You black-souled thing. Gregory has had it with you rats. He held the match closer to Roscaro's face, and a terrible smell of burnt whiskers rose up around the jailer and the rat. And then the match went out, and Gregory, Gregory released Roscaro's tail. He flung him back into the darkness. Do not ever touch Gregory's rope again, or you will be sorry. Roscoe sat on the dungeon floor. The whiskers on the left side of his face were gone. His heart, his heart was beating hard, and though the light from the match had disappeared, it danced still before the rat's eyes, even when he closed to them. Light, he said out loud, and then he whispered the word again. Light. From that moment forward, Roscoe showed an abnormal, inordinate interest in illumination of all sorts. He was always in the darkness of the dungeon, on the lookout for light, the smallest glimmer, the tiniest shimmer. His rat soul longed inexplicably for it. He began to think that light was the only thing that gave life meaning, and he had despaired that there was so little of it to be had. He finally voiced this sentiment to his friend, a very old, one-eared rat named Botticelli Remorso. I think, said Roscaro, that the meaning of life is light. Light? said Botticelli. <laughs> you kill me. Light has nothing to do with it. What does it all mean then? asked Roscaro. The meaning of life, said Botticelli, is suffering specifically the suffering of others. Prisoners, for instance, reducing a prisoner to weeping and wailing and begging is a delightful way to invest your existence with meaning. As he spoke, Botticelli swung from one extraordinary long nail of his right paw a heart-shaped locket. He had taken the locket from a prisoner and hung it on a thin braided rope. Whenever Botticelli spoke, the locket moved. Back and forth and back and forth it swung. Are you listening? Botticelli said to Roscoe. I'm listening. Good, said Botticelli. Do as I say and your life will be full of meaning. This is how to torture a prisoner. First, you must convince him that you are a friend. Listen to him, encourage him to confess his sins, and when the time is right, talk to him. Tell him what he wants to hear. Tell him, for instance, that you will forgive him. This is a wonderful joke to play upon a prisoner to promise forgiveness. Why, said Roscoe. His eyes went back and forth and back and forth. Following the locket. Because, said Botticelli, you will promise it, <laughs> but you will not grant it. You gain his trust and then you deny him. You refuse to offer the very thing he wants. Forgiveness, freedom, friendship, whatever it is. You withhold at this point in his lecture, Botticelli laughed so hard that he had to sit down and catch his breath. The locket swayed slowly back and forth and then stopped altogether. <laughs> said Botticelli. <laughs> you gain his trust, you refuse him, and <laughs> you become what he knew you were all along. What you knew you were all along. Not a friend, not a confessor, not a forgiver. <laughs> but a rat. Botticelli wiped his eyes and shook his head and sighed a sigh of great contentment. <sighs> he set the locket in motion again. At that point, it is most effective to run back and forth over a prisoner's feet, inducing physical terror along with the emotional sort. Oh, he said, it is such a lovely game, such a lovely game. And it is just absolutely chock full of meaning. I would very much like to torture a prisoner, said Roscoe. I would like to make someone suffer. Your time will come, said Botticelli. Currently, all the prisoners are spoken for, but another prisoner will arrive sooner or later. How do I know this to be true? Because, Roscoe, thankfully there is evil in the world, and the presence of evil guarantees the existence of prisoners. So soon there will be a prisoner for me? Yes, said Botticelli. Yes. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Of course you're looking forward to it. You are looking forward to it because you're a rat. A real rat. Yes, said Roscoe. I'm a real rat. Concern not at all with the light, said Botticelli. Concern not at all with the light, said Roscoe. 
Botticelli laughed again and shook his head. The locket, suspended from the long nail on his paw, swung back and forth and back and forth. You, my young friend, are a rat. Exactly. Yes, evil, prisoners, rats, suffering. It all fits together so neatly, so sweetly. Oh, it's a lovely world, a lovely dark world. Chapter 17. Small Comforts. Not long after this conversation between Botticelli and Roscaro, a prisoner did arrive. The dungeon door slammed and the two rats watched a man being led by a king soldier down the stairs into the dungeon. Excellent, whispered Botticelli. This one's yours. Roscaro looked at the man closely. I will make him suffer, he said. But... As he stared up at the man, the door to the dungeon was suddenly flung open and a thick and brilliant shaft of afternoon light cut into the darkness of the dungeon. Ugh, said Botticelli. He covered his eyes with one paw. Roscaro, however, stared directly into the light. Reader, this is important. The rat did not look away. He let the light from upstairs enter him and fill him. He gasped out loud with the wonder of it. "'Give him his small comforts!' shouted a voice at the top of the stairs, and a red cloth was thrown into the light. The cloth hung suspended for a moment, bright, red, and glowing, and then the door was slammed shut again and the light disappeared, and the cloth fell to the floor. It was Gregory the jailer who bent to pick it up. "'Go on,' said the old man as he held out the cloth to the prisoner. "'Take it. You'll need every last bit of warmth down here.' And so the prisoner took the cloth and draped it around his shoulders as if it were a cloak. And the soldier of the king said, Right then, Gregory, he's all yours. And the soldier turned and went back up the steps and opened the door to the outside world, and some small light leaked in before he closed that door behind him. Did you see that? Roscoe said to Botticelli. And that's a little illustration that the author gave us. So that's Roscoe and that's Botticelli. <clears throat> Hideously ugly, said Botticelli. Ridiculous. What can they possibly mean by letting all that light in at once? Don't they know this is a dungeon? It was beautiful, said Roscoe. No, said Botticelli. No. He looked at Roscoe intently. Not beautiful. No. I must see more light. I must see all of it, said Roscoe. I must go upstairs. Botticelli sighed. <sighs> Who cares about the light? Your obsession with it is tiresome. Listen, we are rats. Rats. We do not like light. We are about darkness. We are about suffering. But, said Roscoe, upstairs. No buts, said Botticelli. No buts. None. Rats do not go upstairs. Upstairs is the domain of mice. He took the locket from around his neck. What, he said, swinging it back and forth, is this rope made out of? Whiskers. The whiskers of whom? Mice. Exactly. And who lives upstairs? Mice. Exactly. Mice. Botticelli turned his head and spat on the floor. Mice are nothing but little packages of blood and bones, afraid of everything. They're despicable, laughable, the opposite of everything we strive to be. Do you want to live in their world? Roscoe looked up past Botticelli to the delicious sliver of light that shone out from underneath the door. He said nothing. Listen, said Botticelli, this is what you should do. Go and torture the prisoner. Go and take the red cloth from him. The cloth will satisfy your cravings for something from that world. But do not go up into the light. You will regret it. As he spoke, the locket swung back and forth and back and forth. You do not belong in that world. You are a rat. A rat. Say it with me. A rat, said Roscoe. Ah, but you are cheating. You must say, I am a rat, said Botticelli, smiling his slow smile at Roscoe. I am a rat, said Roscoe. Again said Botticelli, swinging his locket. I am a rat. Exactly, said Botticelli. A rat is a rat is a rat. End of the story. World without end. Amen. Yes, said Roscoe.
Amen, I am a rat. He closed his eyes. He saw again the red cloth spinning against the backdrop of gold. And he told himself, reader, that it was the cloth that he desired and not the light. Chapter 18, Confessions. Roscoe went, as Botticelli told him, to torment the new prisoner and to take the red cloth from him. The man was sitting with his legs stretched out in front of them, chained to the floor. The red cloth was still draped over his shoulders. Roscoe squeezed through the bars and crept slowly over the damp, weeping stones of the cell floor. When he came close to the man, he said, Ah, oh, welcome, welcome. We are delighted to have you. The man lit a match and looked at Roscoe. Roscoe stared longingly to the light. Go on, said the prisoner. He waved a hand in the direction of Roscoe, and the match went out. You're nothing but a rat. I am, said Roscoe. Exactly that. A rat. Allow me to congratulate you on your very astute powers of observation. What do you want, rat? What do I want? Nothing, nothing. Nothing for my sake, that is. I have come for you. I have come to keep you company here in the dark. He crawled closer to the man. I don't need the company of a rat. What about the solace of a sympathetic ear? Do you need that? Huh? Would you like to confess your sins? To a rat? You're kidding, are you? Come now, said Roscoe. Close your eyes. Pretend that I'm not a rat. Pretend that I am nothing but a voice in the darkness. A voice that cares. The prisoner closed his eyes. His eyes. All right, he said. I'll tell you. But I'm not telling you because there ain't no point in not telling you. No point in keeping secrets from a dirty little rat. I ain't in such a desperate way that I need to lie to a rat. The man cleared his throat. <clears throat> I'm here for stealing six cows, two jerseys, and four guernseys. Cow theft. That's my crime. He opened his eyes and stared into the darkness. He laughed. He closed his eyes again. But there's something else I've done many years ago. Another crime. And they don't even know it. Go on, said Roscoe. He crept closer. He allowed one paw to touch the magical red cloth. I traded my girl, my own daughter, for this red tablecloth and for a hen and a handful of cigarettes, said Roscoe. He was not alarmed to hear of such a hideous thing. His parents, after all, had not much cared for him, and certainly, if there was any profit on it, they would have sold him. And then, too, Botticelli Romorso, one lazy Sunday afternoon, had recited from memory all the confessions that he had heard from prisoners, what humans were capable of, <sighs> came no surprise to Roscoe. And then, said the man, and then, encouraged Roscoe, and then I'd done the worst thing of all. I walked away from her, and she was crying and calling out for me, and I didn't even look back. I did not. Oh, Lord, I kept walking. The prisoner cleared his throat. <clears throat> he sniffed. <sighs> Ah, said Roscoe. Yeah, I see. By now he was standing, so all four paws were touching the red cloth. Do you find comfort in this cloth that you sold your child for? It's warm, said the man. Was it worth your child? I like the color of it. Does the cloth remind you of what you have done wrong? It does, the prisoner said. He sniffed. It does. Allow me to ease your burden, said Roscoe. He stood on his hind legs and bowed at the waist. I will take this reminder of your sin from you, he said. The rat took hold of the tablecloth with his strong teeth and pulled it off the shoulders of the man. Hey, see here, I want that back. But Roscoe was quick. He pulled the tablecloth through the bars of the cell, whoosh, like a magic trick in reverse. Hey, shouted the prisoner, bring that back, it's all I got. Yes, said Roscoe, and that is exactly why I must have it. You dirty rat, shouted the prisoner. Yes, said Roscoe, that is right, that is most accurate. He left the man and dragged the tablecloth back to his nest and considered it. What a disappointment it was. Looking at it, Roscoe knew that Botticelli was wrong. What Roscoe wanted, what he needed, was not the cloth, but the light that had shone behind it. 
He wanted to be filled, flooded, blinded again with the light. And for that reader, the rat knew that he must go upstairs. Chapter 19. Light. Light everywhere. Imagine, if you will, having spent the whole of your life in a dungeon. Imagine that late one spring day you step out of the dark into a world of bright windows and polished floors, winking copper pots, shining suits of armor, and tapestries sewn in gold. Imagine. And while you're imagining things, imagine this too. Imagine that at the same time the rat steps from the dungeon and into the castle, a mouse is being born upstairs. A mouse, reader, who is destined to meet this light bedazzled rat. I wonder who that mouse could be. But that meeting will occur much later. And for now, the rat is nothing but happy, delighted, amazed to find himself standing in so much light. I, said Roscoe, spinning dizzily from one bright thing to the next, will never leave. No, never. I will never go back to the dungeon. Why would I? I will never torture another prisoner. It is here that I belong. The rat waltzed happily from room to room until he found himself at the door of the banquet hall. He looked inside and saw gathered there King Philip, Queen Rosemary, and the Princess P. Twenty noble people, a juggler, four minstrels, and all the king's men. This party, reader, was a sight for a rat's eye. Rosgrove had never seen happy people. He had only known the miserable ones. Gregory the jailer and those who were consigned to his domain did not smile or laugh or clink glasses with the person sitting next to them. Rosgrove was enchanted. Everything glittered. Everything, the gold spoons on the table and the jingle bells of the juggler's cap, the strings on the minstrel's guitars and the count and the crowns on the king and the queen's head. And the little princess, how lovely was she! How much light, light itself! Her gown was covered in sequins that winked and glimmered at the rat. And when she laughed, and she laughed often, everything around her seemed to glow brighter. Oh, really, said Roscoe. This is too extraordinary. This is too wonderful. I must tell Botticelli that he was wrong. Suffering is not the answer. Light is the answer. And he made his way into the banquet hall, and he lifted his tail off the ground and held it at an angle and marched in time to the music the minstrels were playing on their guitars. The rat, reader, invited himself to the party. Chapter 20. A View from a Chandelier. There was, in the banquet hall, a most beautiful and ornate, ornate chandelier. The crystals hung from it, the crystals that hung from it caught the light of the candles on the table and the light from the face of the laughing princess. They danced to the rhythm of the minstrel's music, swaying back and forth, twinkling and beckoning. What better place to view all this glory, all this beauty? There was so much laughing and singing and juggling that no one noticed as Roscoe climbed up a table leg onto the table and from there flung himself onto the lowest branch of the chandelier. Hanging by one paw, he swung back and forth, admiring the spectacle below him, the smells of the food, the sound of the music, and the light, the light, the light. Amazing. Unbelievable. Roscoe smiled and shook his head. Unfortunately, a rat can hang from a chandelier for only so long before he's discovered. This would be the tr this would be true at even the loudest party. Reader, do you know who it was who spotted him? You're right, the sharp-eyed Princess P. A rat! She shouted. A rat is hanging from the chandelier. The party, as I have noted, was loud. The minstrels were strumming and singing, the people were laughing and eating, the man with the jingle cap was jungling and jingling. No one in the midst of all this merriment heard the pee. No one except for Roscoe. Rat. He had never before been aware of what an ugly word that was. Rat. In the middle of all that beauty, it became immediately clear that it was an extremely distasteful syllable, rat. 
a curse, an insult, a word totally without light. And not until he heard it from the mouth of the princess did Rosgro realize that he did not like being a rat, that he did not want to be a rat. This revelation hit Rosgro with such force that it made him lose his grip on the chandelier. The rat, reader, fell. And alas, he fell right directly into the queen's bowl of soup. Chapter 21. The Queen's Last Words. The Queen loved soup. She loved soup more than anything in the world, except for the Princess Pea and the King. And because the Queen loved it, soup was served in the castle for every banquet, every lunch, every dinner. And what soup it was! Cook's love and an admiration for the Queen and her palate moved the broth that she that she concocted from the level of mere food to a high art, which means that the cook made really good soup. On this particular day, for this particular banquet, Cook had outdone herself. The soup was a masterwork, a delicate mingling of chicken, watercress, and garlic. Rosgro, as he surfaced from the bottom of the queen's bowl, could not help but taking a few appreciative sips Lovely, he said, distracted for a moment from the misery of his existence. Delightful. See, shouted the pea, see? She stood and pointed her finger right at Rosgro. It is a rat. I told you that it was a rat. He was hanging from the chandelier and now he's in Mama's soup. The musicians stopped playing their guitars. The juggler stopped juggling. The noble people stopped eating. And the queen looked at Rosgro. Rosgro looked at the queen. Reader, in the spirit of honesty, I must utter a difficult and unsavory truth. Rats are not beautiful creatures. They're not even cute. They are ra really rather nasty beasts, particularly if one happens to appear in your bowl of soup with pieces of watercress clinging to his whiskers. There was a long moment of silence, and then Roscoe said to the queen, I beg your pardon. In response, the queen flung her spoon in the air and made an incredible noise, a noise that was in no way worthy of a queen, a noise somewhere between the neigh of a horse and the squeal of a pig, a noise that sounded something like this, Nick! and then she said, there's a rat in my soup. The queen was really a simple soul and always her whole life had done nothing except state the obvious. She died as she lived. There is a rat in my soup were the last words she uttered. She clutched her chest and fell over backward. Her royal chair hit the floor with a thump, and the banquet hall exploded. Spoons were dropped, chairs were flung back. Save her, thundered the king, you must save her. All of the king's men ran to try and rescue the queen. Rosgro climbed out of the bowl of soup. He felt that, under the circumstances, it would be best if he left. And he crawled across the tablecloth, and he remembered the words of the prisoner in the dungeon. His regret that he did not look back at his daughter as he left her. And so, Rosgro turned, and he looked back. And he saw that princess was glaring at him. Her eyes were filled with disgust and anger. Go back to the dungeon, was what the look she gave him. Go back to the dungeon where you belong. This look broke Rosgro's heart. Did you think that rats, that rats do not have hearts? Wrong. All living things have a heart, and the heart of any living, living thing can be broken. If the rat had not looked over his shoulder, perhaps his heart would not have been broken. And it is possible, then, I would not have a story to tell you. But reader, he did look. And that is where we're going to leave. And we're going to leave off for next time. I really hope that you enjoyed that story. And we got to meet a lot of different characters, a lot of new characters. Um, and... A lot, of, a lot of crazy things happen in those chapters, huh? Um, if you want to, if you have any questions, clarifying questions about the plot, the setting, 
the characters, the details or events in the story. Um, if you want to write them down or send them to me, you are more than welcome to. But thank you for reading with me today. Okay, see you later.